when we get closer and closer to <laughs> when things are happening, uh, turns out I have a class right from nine to 10. And then I have another class starting 11 on. And that one is at uh, Urban Dharma <laughs> that I need to get to. <laughs> so, so you need to leave early. A little bit. Yeah, I've already told them at Urban Dharma to just kind of, you know, chill and hang out and wait. So it's not a formal program. So it's okay. So so no no worries. But uh, it's all. Uh huh. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. huh? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> in Buddhist song in, in Malaysia, from a young age, he studied and practiced Buddhism with teachers of various traditions. He met his Tibetan teacher in the United States. After earning a doctorate degree in Buddhist studies at the University of Virginia and teaching for 10 years in American academic Dr. Lai left academia to develop his energy. Full time to join the work. In 2013, he was admitted at George Union which is literally the oh. master, <laughs> master, not a master, but a German. New students in Kaju, Vinay, New students in Kaju, not Bong, Tissing, I'm sorry, I'm head of the lineage, and was born. Formerly in the room with his own student, Hanad, made Malaysia. When not teaching, leading the spirits and serving the lineage in Asia and North and South America, Dr. Lai teaches in Asheville, where he is founder and spiritual director of Urban Dharma in North Carolina. Welcome. And thank you. And also, as uh, Tejo can attest to, uh, when not uh, away, I'm in Asheville and also in farmer's markets. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the season uh, that in the, uh, according to the Indian uh, calendar, uh, we have entered the month called Vaishaka. Vaishaka. So uh, Vaishaka, is where the name Vesak uh, is derived from. Uh, Vesak is actually a uh, modern uh, Singhala um, word, Singhala being the dominant language in Sri Lanka, uh, and it's derived from the original uh, Sanskrit, which is uh, Vaishaka. So Vaishaka, uh, in the Indian calendar uh, is the, uh, I believe it's the second month uh, of the beginning of a new cycle of a new year. Uh, so Vaishaka is the second month. Uh, and this month of Vaishaka uh, across Buddhist traditions is remembered as a significant month uh, because uh, the most significant uh, uh, event that happened in this month uh, is, of course, uh, called the uh, mm, awakening or the enlightenment uh, of the Buddha. Now, uh, this date of the enlightenment, uh, which is said to be the full moon day of the month of Vaishaka, is a tradition that is uh, accepted in the Theravada uh, world across the Theravada cultures, whether in Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, or Laos. Uh, also accepted in the uh, Northern Himalayan Tibetan uh, tradition. However, as I'm sure many of you know, in East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, uh, the Day of Enlightenment is actually uh, said to have occurred uh, on a different month. Uh, 
However, a survey across uh, these traditions, these Buddhist traditions, there is another occasion, uh, another important event uh, that is the birth of the Buddha or the birth of Prince Siddhartha. And for that, maybe whoever has the and uh, silence everyone. Uh, I think whoever has the power of the host can do something. Ahí está, ahí está una albahaca, aquí hay no sé qué. Uh, yeah. So everyone be aware that sometimes, especially when you're using iPhone, uh, the iPhone can can mysteriously turn your uh, audio on. <laughs> so anyway, uh, where there is that where there seems to be universal agreement is that uh, in this Vaishaka month, uh, Siddhartha was born. Yes. So across now, uh, the whole span of the Buddhist uh, cultures, uh, from South Asia to North Asia to East Asia to Southeast Asia, uh, there is universal agreement that the birth of the Buddha happened uh, in this month. Mm. Uh, but overall, I think mm, you could say the international Buddhist community uh, some time ago, uh, meaning very sometime, uh, very recently, some time ago in the last 50 years, uh, some kind of consensus uh, has uh, surfaced, come together, where Vesak, uh, uh, and specifically the full moon day of Vesak, uh, is now recognized as uh, the day that uh, Buddhists commemorate, celebrate, remember uh, the birth, uh, the awakening, and the passing away of the Buddha. So just as kind of a universal now Buddhist uh, convention. So in the end, um, these are all conventions. Uh, these are relative realities. Uh, now, of course, even within the realm of relative realities, some things are more relative than others. Some things are more tentative than others. And so not at all suggesting or advocating uh, the position of, you know, you can believe just about whatever you want to believe, <laughs> especially if your beliefs impact the lives of others. Uh, not advocating for that position, but nonetheless, right? Those of us who practice the Dharma know uh, that the Buddha says uh, these are merely worldly conventions. Uh, so the key is uh, how to skillfully engage uh, worldly conventions so that we can uh, become free from uh, the confines of uh, conventions, especially the conventions that are based on and reinforce habits of suffering. So the um, coming back then uh, to the celebration of Vesak, uh, then uh, the international Buddhist community uh, is uh, remembering and celebrating uh, the full moon day of uh, this month, this uh, and the way, actually, by the way, uh, Sri Lanka determines this is um, to designate the first full moon of May okay, to be that day. So this is like combining a lunar and a solar calendar. Uh, so it's like a loony solar uh, way of determining. So Sri Lanka uh, does it this way. The first full moon of the month of May becomes the day for Vesak. Then in the uh, Himalayan Tibetan tradition, uh, the tradition that I'm mostly grounded in, uh, this month of uh, Vaishaka, 
or we call it Saga, by Saga. So Saga, and we call it Saga Dawa. Uh, in our tradition, Saga Dawa, uh, the full moon day commemorates uh, the awakening and the great passing away of the Buddha. Uh, but the, uh, and the birth uh, is said to have happened on the eighth day of this month, which is also actually uh, similar to uh, how it is observed in East Asia, in Korea, uh, Japan, uh, China, uh, and Vietnam. Mm. So in the uh, Tibetan tradition, uh, this it is said that all acts of virtue, you know, all virtuous actions, all skillful actions, uh, all meritorious actions uh, that are uh, created in this whole month, uh, that their positive results are multiplied uh, by uh, millions fold. Uh, so, like, so as a result, this whole month uh, across the Tibetan Himalayan uh, cultural areas, uh, there is, it's almost like you could say, uh, it's a practice intensive month. Uh, a lot of lay people engage in uh, taking uh, more precepts, like the eight precepts, uh, engaging in fasting, uh, engaging in doing uh, these, you know, long uh, full body prostrations. Um, there's this practice known as Nyungne, uh, which is a, a, a two day uh, fasting and prostrations uh, practice where you take the eight precepts. Uh, so like you come the night before and you begin very early on the first day um, where you take the eight precepts. Um, then that day you only eat uh, one meal, which is right before uh, noon. You take that meal. Uh, then you continue uh, as a group to do these uh, full body prostrations. Mm, then uh, the second day, uh, the whole day, you don't take any food. Uh, you do full prostrations. Uh, and then you, then the following morning, uh, you uh, return the eight precepts, uh, return, so to say, the eight precepts, and then break your fast uh, on the morning of the third day. Uh, so many lay people, especially during this time, those people who have the, the, the circumstance and the leisure and the you know, devotion to do this, uh, they do like a seven or eight sets of Nyungne during this Sagadawa month. Seven to eight sets of that. <laughs> uh, so this month uh, is, is, is um, a way for us, I think, to relate to uh, this month, uh, even if you know, there's a part of us that understands that, oh, this, these are just conventions you know, based on notions of calendar. And we know that uh, calendars have changed. And, uh, so I think without getting so um, fixated or attached to uh, the minute details uh, of when and what happened, I think this is a good time for us to remember and to reflect upon the example of Shakyamuni Buddha. So the example of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, the most fundamental basic uh, level of relating to the example of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, is the fact that he was born, he was born as a human. We say an extraordinary human, but that he was born as a human and an extraordinary human is not by chance. It is due to the deep vows, the deep aspirations, the deep vows that he took many, many, many lifetimes ago. Uh, as I often say to people, I have no 
uh, objective scientific way to prove to you uh, without any doubt whatsoever uh, of the uh, veracity of you know multiple infinite lifetimes uh, going into the past and into the future but i also believe that uh, to practice the dharma while there is no need uh, to force yourself to believe in this notion of many, many lifetimes. There is, however, uh, I would argue, uh, it is, however, uh, beneficial and skillful uh, to think in terms of many, many, many lifetimes. One of the benefits, I feel, of being willing and able to think in terms of many, many, many lifetimes is so that our perspective don't become so limited. Undoubtedly, thinking about many, 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 many lifetimes can sometimes excuse our laziness so that we are not really taking full opportunity of what we have now, like the good health that we have now, the relatively good conditions that we have now. You know, sometimes we don't take good advantage of that to really work on you know, clearing our uh, uh, mental defilements, uh, our afflictive emotions, our kleshas, uh, our bonno. Right? Mm. Undoubtedly, you know, thinking that, oh, there's another lifetime. <laughs> we can then postpone this work. But that wasn't why the Buddha taught uh, this notion of many, many lifetimes. If we are to believe, you know, the earlier sources, already in the earlier sources, uh, it's said that the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha, when he achieved enlightenment, uh, in the earlier sources that we find in the Pali tradition and also preserved in some Sanskrit texts, uh, it says that uh, that fateful night uh, under the Bodhi tree, three types of knowledges arose in him, uh, which is what makes a Buddha a Buddha, yeah, an awakened one. Uh, in these ancient traditions, it says there are three uh, knowledges that arose in him. The first knowledge that arose in him uh, was the knowledge of all his previous lifetimes. He could see all his previous lifetimes where in this life, he was this person, this, that, this, that, this happened, that happened. Then in the next life, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. And so this is said to be the first knowledge. The second knowledge that arose after that first knowledge was the knowledge, the ability to see uh, in that moment, uh, all the comings and the goings and the passing away and the rebirth uh, of all beings uh, in that moment. That, that is the second knowledge the Buddha gained. Uh, and all the past lives of all the different beings. And at the third knowledge, is the knowledge of reality as it is, the final breakthrough that then put him you know, in the state of being Buddha, awake, completely and fully awake. Now, I think on the folk level, I would say, on the superficial level, when we talk about, oh, being able to see all our past lifetimes, to be able to see other people's past lifetimes, to be able to see even at this moment uh, how uh, this person now dying is born there as this and that. I think on the folk level, on the superficial level, which unfortunately tends to be the way that people think about these things, then they think about like, you know, oh, oh, somebody became a cow. Oh, then this cow became a person. Mm -hmm. Then uh, all kinds of like magical ideas and stories, right, come in. But I think we have missed the main point about um, 
these knowledges about past lifetimes and future lifetimes. The main lesson, the main point of these knowledges of past lifetimes, future lifetimes, whether ours or others, it's talking about the Buddha. A Buddha is a Buddha because a Buddha sees cause and effect. How cause and effect works without mistake. How karmic causality is the underlying principle of all phenomena as phenomena manifest. I think we're quite familiar, you know, with the notion of emptiness or vastness or boundlessness or limitlessness, whether stated positively or stated in the form of negation, stated in the form of negation, emptiness is empty of, free of, in the absence of, right? The confusions, the mental defilements, the uh, afflictions, the grasping, the fixations yeah, into concreteness, all of that, right, stated negatively. Stated positively, emptiness is about boundlessness and limitlessness. The way that uh, the late uh, Venerable Ting Nahan talks about interdependence. But we say that is one side, uh, like the hand, right? Our hand has two front and back side, or front and back, however you look at it, right? So one side is this boundlessness, one side is this emptiness. But the other side is the interdependences that give rise to phenomena. You know, how the infinite multiplicity of phenomena uh, unfolds and how those with minds, uh, you and me, uh, get uh, our relationship with the unfolding of phenomena. So if we don't see uh, cause and effect, if we don't, at the very least, understand this basic principle of cause and effect, which is that when you plant an apple seed, you can only have an apple tree. When you plant a mango seed, you can only have a mango tree. No matter how much you pray, how much you wish for, <laughs> how much you plead with whoever, you know, Planting an apple seed will never result in a mango tree. You can say, please, please, pretty, please. It's not going to happen. So this is one of, you know, the important knowledges that came to Siddhartha. In, we say, absolute clarity. Now, for the rest of us, absolute clarity may seem pretty impossible. Yeah, because when we talk about cause and effect, you know, also the Buddha's teachings on cause and effect is not so naive uh, as often represented in, 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 in like superficial ways. Oh, you kick the dog. Uh, that explains why, you know, yesterday somebody, you know, no rhyme and reason came and kicked you, you know. Oh, that's because, you know, seven and a half lifetimes ago, you know, you for no rhyme or reason kicked the dog. There are stories like this for sure. But that's not, that's just to make the point about that in this working of cause and effect, there are no mistakes. And even Buddhas do not escape, so to say, this basic principle of cause and effect. And anyone who says so has gone the wrong direction. And for this, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Dogen's teachings on this matter, uh, right? I think Venerable uh, Tejo uh, might remember the story of uh, uh, Dogen com commenting on a, a koan case uh, of a Chinese Chan master giving a 
teaching, giving lectures, and then there's a mysterious person that turns up at every class. But then after a while, this person stops coming. So then the disciples ask this Zen master, uh, who, you know, who was that mysterious guy? And the Zen master said, mm, actually, go, go into the forest in this direction, you know, and you will find uh, the, the corpse of a fox. And so his disciples went, you know, and they found uh, this corpse and the master said, bring it back. We will have, give it a proper uh, cremation uh, because this is the final life uh, of 500 lifetimes as a fox uh, for this particular person. And so then the Zen master said, actually, before all of this happened, you know, he was a teacher. And one day the disciple asked him, you know, are Buddhas free from cause and effect? And he gave the wrong answer. He said, yes. And as a result of that, he was reborn for 500 lifetimes as a fox. <laughs> so even Buddhas are not free from cause and effect. And the, I think the more important point is, uh, one thing to think about being free of cause and effect tells us something about your understanding of cause and effect, right? That means you see the principle of cause and effect as something negative uh, that you want to escape. Uh, so you say, how can I be free from karma? How can I be free from cause and effect? Hmm? <laughs> but that's just wishful thinking. In fact, that's just plain wrong view. Yes, the text describes Siddhartha uh, as having achieved uh, freedom from karma. Yes, there are texts, there are traditions using those words, saying that under the Bodhi tree, when he attained Buddhahood, uh, what he attained was freedom. Uh, he has broke all the bonds uh, of karma. Yeah. When it says that he has broken the bonds of karma, it is not saying uh, that he has broken <laughs> the law of karma, the principle of cause and effect. It is saying that uh, what it is saying is, uh, what is a Buddha? A Buddha is someone who now uh, has completely removed any and all possibilities of creating, uh, of living his or her life in any way uh, that goes against the principles of cause and effect. And in this way, they become free from cause and effect. So I think this is one example, one lesson in the season of Sakadawa, of Vaishaka, of Vesak, that we should remember. An important point that in some ways, you know, there are many ways to say, let's summarize the teachings of the Buddha. And different Buddhist traditions have used uh, different frameworks uh, to kind of highlight uh, the key aspects of the Buddhist teachings. In this one, uh, I would say, uh, if we look at it from the angle of karmic causality, uh, then we can see very clearly also how everything the Buddha taught uh, is about karmic causality. Again, not in the superficial way. And some of you might remember NBC, maybe 20 years ago, I was in maybe graduate school, or there is a series for a while, and maybe three or four seasons, this, this, this comedy called My Name is Earl. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> this guy who has a list, you know, he, 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 he got ran over by a bus, I think, but then he didn't die. Then he, he, there was a reckoning, you know, so he came up with a list of like all the wrongs that he has done that he has to, um, you know, uh, fix. Uh, and he's checking off that list, you know. And uh, so then this thing, you know, the, the superficial idea of karma, you know, is like the main idea in, in this. And we're not talking about that kind of superficial uh, ideas about karma, but rather the deeper 
principles of causality. Uh, and the deeper principle of causality, if we really understand that, then we say, yes, how wonderful uh, that Siddhartha realized this, achieved this, and taught this to us. Because what that means is happiness and suffering is in our own hands. Then more importantly, happiness is an inside job. <laughs> yes, others can help. Yes, others do help. Yes, others can provide the conditions, the circumstances. But if we don't create the causes, in other words, if we don't again and again and again make that decision that I am going to choose uh, happiness and its causes. Now, even though in this situation, right, even if in this situation, things are arranged in such a way that is unfair, uh, that is not uh, good, that I don't like, I, I will still choose uh, happiness and the causes of happiness. Not out of a sense of like, you know, because I want to have a halo behind my head, because I want to live up uh, to some image of being a good Buddhist. Mm -hmm. Those things are not useful. Mm -hmm. Even when we say I will choose happiness and the causes of happiness, it can come from a wrong place. So it has to come from a right place. And where is that right place? That right place is from understanding from what we call understanding or big Buddhist word, wisdom. <laughs> Simply means, you know, seeing more clearly. Seeing more clearly. So when we see more clearly, then we choose. We have, we know that we can choose even as things are unfolding, perhaps things are unfolding in a way that really, you know, is not at all conducive to us choosing happiness, but at least remember, we can still choose happiness. And then of course, you know, because of our habits, then we choose suffering. <laughs> But having some idea that, oh, I could have chosen happiness, but because of habits, now I've chosen suffering again. It, it gives some space, you know. It, 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 it allows some space to come in, even when we are caught in very tight spaces. And then because of caught in tight spaces, we choose suffering. At least some, I, some notion that I could have chosen happiness. To me, at least, for me, at least, it gives me some space to breathe. Ah, yeah, silly me, you know, chose the wrong thing again, but it's okay. <laughs> because it also should not become so heavy. Our practice should not become so heavy. To say that we have a choice that we can choose, this is not a burden. That message can sometimes turn into a burden. And sometimes knowingly, unknowingly, other people make it a burden and say, you are responsible, right? In this day and time, you know, politically, socially, and it's all very tricky. You know, when we say things like this, people will say, oh, you're blaming the victim. And, and of course, we have to be careful not to do that. But please, please, you know, when you understand the Buddhist teachings about karmic causality, also understand and recognize this is not a burden. This is what we call the gospel according to the Buddha, the good news according to the Buddha. This is about opportunity. This is about possibility. Do we always choose the right thing? Oh, you and I know probably not. <laughs> to have some sense of humor, you know? And that comes from having touch, having experience, the boundlessness. The spaciousness, the emptiness. 
then all the arisings of cause and effect. Sometimes we like, sometimes we don't like. They are all handprints pressed upon space. Smudges on space, not mirrors. Even mirrors you, know, you can clean. But there are handprints on space. So though, then when we hold these two, sometimes seemingly contradictory, but it's not. It's the true face of reality. One side is emptiness, one side is cause and effect. When we hold these two together, almost like sometimes like intention, like that they seem to be opposed, but they are not. It's the perfectly interpenetrating realities of emptiness and cause and effect. And to me, you know, this is the lesson that, you know, if this month we can make more effort, you know, recognizing in this month, we are remembering Siddhartha's great realization, then we can use this month to kind of beef up, so to say, strengthen or tofu up, you know, tofu has a lot of good proteins. Tofu up, you know, of a Dharma practice and then strengthen our own hearts and minds. This then becomes, you know, a meaningful way to remember and commemorate Vesak, Vaishaka. So next weekend, as I'm sure you know, uh, we're having a joint Vesak uh, celebration uh, at Urban Dharma, uh, which is a joint celebration this year uh, between uh, Zen Center of Asheville, a great tree, uh, and Urban Dharma. Mm. In previous years, uh, we have done bigger things, uh, but this year, especially over here at Urban Dharma, we are feeling a little uh, exhausted with all the things and I'm leaving town very quickly. I just came back from out of town. Uh, and so uh, we're doing a more modest uh, celebration, but of course everyone is invited and please come and join us together. Uh, I always uh, appreciate uh, any and all opportunities uh, to do joint uh, programs, especially uh, with uh, Tejo and uh, all the uh, communities that Tejo supports. Uh, when I first came to this area uh, in 2003, not too long afterwards, I think, uh, I don't know exactly when uh, I connected with uh, Tejo, uh, maybe a couple of years later after that and uh, have seen all the wonderful things that uh, has been done uh, resulting in now uh, having the great trees and women's temple and community and seeing the growth of that community. Uh, by the way, as you were reciting at the beginning, Tejo, uh, may, maybe you know about this, uh, but I'll use this opportunity to share with everyone. Uh, the opening gata I, I know it in Chinese. I, I don't know the exact translation that, that you guys use in Chinese. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zhou Yi, Wo Jin Jian Men De Shou Ci, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. May I realize the true meaning of the Tathagata's uh, uh, teachings. Uh, it is said that this gata was composed uh, by the one and only female emperor of China. Uh, and, and they call her empress, but empress gives the connotation that she's ruling because she married uh, uh, her husband, who is the emperor. But no, she actually became a ruler of all China uh, herself during the 
there was a short period in the Tang Dynasty, the, one of the greatest Chinese dynasties that went from the 600s to 900s in the early part during the time of the fourth emperor. She was married to the fourth emperor, but then when the emperor died, she took over herself and declared herself sovereign of the nation. Uh, she attempted to start a new dynasty, but then uh, after her, things got reversed back to the Tang. Uh, so Empress Wu uh, was her name, Emperor, Empress Wu, or female Emperor Wu, uh, was a devout Buddhist, uh, supported uh, the Chan tradition in particular, but all Buddhist traditions in China. And so she composed uh, that opening verse that has now used all across East Asia. Whenever Dharma teachings occur, whenever chanting of uh, uh, sutras occur, uh, especially in I know in Chinese Buddhism, that gata uh, is used. Uh, so it was very uh, nice to hear that gata and to be reminded of uh, uh, Emperor Wu. <laughs> So I don't know if uh, maybe a few minutes of questions or at least discussions or comments. <laughs> this is reminding me of a saying we have when you don't have anything nice to say don't say anything <laughs> um i would just like to share a comment um mm -hmm. your your talk was really lovely thank you for everything that you shared um and it just reminded me of one of my favorite um verses that uh, the Buddha spoke in the Dhammapada. He said, if I recall correctly, through the rounds of many births I roam, without reward and without rest, searching for the house builder. Yes. It is painful taking birth again and again. House builder, you're seen. You will not build this house again. Gone to the unformed. The mind has come to the end of craving. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. Uh, and that, those words are said to be uttered uh, at the gaining of the third knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, when he finally uh, dismantled everything, so to say. And the house builder is, of course, uh, uh, this, this confused mind. Uh, and uh, you know, having seen completely uh, how the confused mind uh, then uh, creates suffering, uh, then this has been dismantled now, and the work is done. It's finished. You, you mentioned folk tradition and kind of folk interpretations of, of karma. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, they lend themselves to misinterpretation, as you said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it, it seems that all religions, no matter which, have those as a really strong uh -huh. opponent. And I, I, I kind of wonder how you, um, I mean, they, they seem to limit the, well, not really, but it, it seems that those versions can keep people stuck in a uh, kind of trap of, of, of thinking they understand Stand or they are in touch with the, the, the real teachings when in fact they're kind of going down a, a dead end. Uh -huh. I wonder, 
how you think about the value and the right and the the negativity of of those kind of teachings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I think um, folk traditions, uh, the way that they are, is it is as I think just a result of people uh, trying to. Uh, understand something at the level that they can relate to. So it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say, in this case, at least in the case of karma, these folk traditions, they are not so much um, destructive or dangerous as they are imprecise. And so it spoke to people who were only able to think in those terms. So at least it stopped, you know, some kids from kicking dogs, yeah? <laughs> tossing kittens into, you know, rivers. <laughs> mm, to that degree, you know, it, it stopped, uh, you know, people from, uh, but they are limited conventions. And then there are conventions that the Buddha prescribed and the conventions that the Buddha prescribed uh, it's not so easy. It takes effort. Uh, it takes effort. It takes willingness to, uh, do, you know, kind of dive into it and to understand it. Yeah. Mm. So I, my own feelings about this is, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm okay in some degree. You know? Like there are these folk ideas and the folk ideas, there's also something endearing about them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I can allow space for that, you know, and, and, and kind of appreciate it for what it is. And of course, it's easier to appreciate it for, you know, I'm not stuck with it. You know, when I was like nine or 10, you know, like, yes, there's a feeling of like being stuck with it. And it's like, oh, this is terrible. I don't like this. <laughs> Because it seemed to be right something that grown ups used to terrorize mm, kids. Um, uh, but then there is some endearing qualities to some of these stories. Uh, and the nature of these stories, and so often these folk ideas come from stories. Mm -hmm. And the thing about stories is that stories are much more malleable, mm -hmm. right? Rather than uh, philosophical treatises, hmm? like I've written, right? And you can say, you know, like, why don't they just write down these teachings clearly and as precisely as we can, right? Like a legal hmm, document. Of course, you know, if you've ever gone to see an attorney's office in the old days, right? They're like a whole library, right? To further, um, unpack what a, 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 a period means in this sentence. <laughs> but stories and tales, you know, which is the Buddha's actually preferred way to, to point, the finger pointing to the moon, the Buddha told stories. And from those stories, people have come up with kind of their way to understand you know, what the Buddha is saying. And that's also where I think these folk traditions come from. Uh, and so there's some of that quality there. <laughs> I think there's a hand up, uh, a virtual hand. Please go ahead. <laughs> and if you can come closer to your microphone, we can hear you better. We're not yet hearing you in case you have started speaking. I think it's muted still at the temple. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Thank you. That's the, you, were, you were speaking earlier about um, choosing happiness 
in, mm -hmm. in moments where, where suffering is, might be an easier choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering how one should be careful about that choice in a way that is not clinging <laughs> and can still be aware of, you know, sort of the suffering in, in happiness because right. of its impermanence. Yes, yes. Yeah, so clinging mm, <laughs> is a problem. But the first level of problem is even to recognize, right, mm, that actions tainted by uh, the three basic uh, poisons of uh, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. Actions tainted by that necessarily, uh, the fruits, the results uh, are, are spoiled, uh, so to say. So meaning they are productive of suffering. Mm. So that basic principle. Then next step. Given that uh, mm, ignorance or confusion is very strong, uh, very subtle, very strong, very powerful, until we are Buddhists, <laughs> it's hard to say, you know, is there any action that is not tainted by confusion, right? So then we need to strategize, you know, what should we quote unquote worry about in the immediate? Then in the immediate, I think, uh, for me, I, I'm just giving you my, my opinion. We should first start with, you know, actions, that are motivated by, of the three poisons, it's said that the most obvious one and the most obviously harmful one, meaning that you can see more clearly that it's harmful, are actions tainted by anger and resentment, all of that related to that particular poison. Because those actions, you know, its effects can immediately be felt by the person creating those actions. And if there is an object that those actions are directed to, then the objects having to deal with that, their suffering, which may come back in the form of anger and, 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 and force, is also very obvious. So that's the first one to be careful about. The second type uh, actions that are mainly kind of driven by uh, attachment, uh, grasping, greed. It said that those types of actions, um, they are more subtle um, and easier to kind of justify. Uh, so that is when uh, it says that loving kindness, metta, maitri, has a near enemy. Near enemy means, looks like a friend, looks like it's in the same uh, department, so to say, but it's actually uh, uh, wolves yeah, dressed in sheepskin, so to say, right? Uh, is uh, uh, attachment. And so often we have a hard time figuring out what is it? Is it attachment or is it loving kindness? Very hard. So then those types of actions, the Buddha says, because it's harder to figure that out, then the hold that attachment has on us, entanglements, I like that word better, to translate this as entanglements. And I think that when we use the word entanglement, then we, we can work with, right, all the different shades of what we just normally call attachment. First of all, avoid entanglements. So there immediately we know, yes, there's no, <laughs> no virtue, no, no good in getting like, you know, entangled. So Try not to get entangled. Mm -hmm. uh, but Buddha says that those types of actions, you know, is harder than uh, actions uh, primarily motivated by anger 
and resentment. Then the hardest to figure out, to notice, is those actions motivated by, driven by ignorance, which in a way underlies you know, most of our actions on this side of confusion. So with the issue of grasping and attachment, I think uh, it's also inaccurate or, or, or not helpful to think that, you know, oh, Buddha says we should get rid of attachments. I, I, the Buddha didn't exactly say get rid of your attachments. The Buddha says attachment is one of the root causes of suffering, of dissatisfaction. So, what do we get rid of? Not exactly get rid of attachment, but get rid of, more importantly, the ignorance or the confusion that gave rise to attachment. So to do that, we have to skillfully navigate what are useful attachments to have right now, and what are useless attachments to have right now? <laughs> and progressively, right? Clear ignorance or confusion. Clear the clouding of our eyes and our hearts so that we can see more and more clearly. And then we can be free from entanglements from attachments, not by necessarily like getting rid of attachments. There's a danger in like in focusing too much on like, I need to get rid of attachment. Then, especially uh, in the context of Bodhisattva vow, we might end up abandoning sentient beings. And so we have to be careful about that. For those for whom their dharma practice is informed by this notion of the bodhisattva vow, then we, 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 we need to be a little bit more careful with this idea that to get rid of attachment, to get rid of attachment, because we might unwittingly slip into abandoning sentient beings. I see a hand at the temple at Urban it's, Dharma, but it's I'm going. Eleven oh one. Do you want to answer yes, the I'm, question? I'm, or? I'm going to ignore that hand because I'm going over there now. They can ask me there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. And, and I uh, I want to honor your need to leave right now, and we'll see you next week. Yes. At, see you next at week. Risa. Yes. Between now and then, uh, we will uh, message each other about you know this and that, and. Uh, and one thing for sure is we need to borrow, you know, the, the structure <laughs> for the flower pavilion. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we'll figure that out. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for attending. And uh, again, we're going to give back the merit. Yes, please. Please do the dedication yeah. now. Go ahead. We do a uh, call and response. Mm -hmm. May the merit of this practice. May the merit of this practice benefit all beings, benefit all beings, and bring peace, and bring peace. Thank you. And everyone, please stay on for announcements. <laughs> and go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. I thought you might want to be the 